Welcome to this episode of the program, Watch Therefore. Do you think Bible prophecy is important? And while so many today, even who profess the name of Jesus, they think it's unimportant, what does the God of creation think about Bible prophecy? What does His Word say about it? Well, today we're going to look at some key prophecies of not only the first coming of Messiah Jesus, but also the second. And there's a very specific point I want to make that you'll hear very clearly by the end of this program. But first, let's have a word of prayer. O oh, Father in heaven, in Messiah Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you for this life we have in Christ Jesus. Oh, bless every viewer today. And thank you for our soon coming Messiah, Yeshua. He's coming back for us in the rapture, Father. Oh, please send him. We're looking for him. And for those who aren't yet looking for him, may today be their day to begin to do so. We thank you, Holy Father, in Messiah Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm in. I'm continuing in this kind of mini-series teaching, Profiles from Isaiah. And we're going to look, as I said a moment ago, at some key prophecies from Isaiah of the first and even the second coming of Messiah Jesus. Well, a primary way, not a secondary way, a primary way, the Lord God Almighty distinguishes himself from false gods is through Bible prophecy. That's what he says in Isaiah chapter 46. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. The Lord tells all of creation what he's going to do, including his enemies, the devil and the devil's followers. And then he dares anyone to try to stop him because nobody can stop him from fulfilling his prophetic word, which gives glory to him, our Father in heaven, his only begotten Son, our Messiah, Yeshua, and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of the living God. Well, here the Lord, he's referring to King Cyrus, the Lord's man, to come in and destroy Babylon, this bird of prey from the east. And he mentions him by name. It's, it's Cyrus. The Lord, through Isaiah, also speaks of King Cyrus sending the Jews back from Babylonian captivity to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Listen to these verses. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. And down to verse 45, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. Hey, so what's the big deal about that? He named Cyrus. Well, Isaiah was written in the 700s B.C. Cyrus lived from 590 to 529 B.C. and reigned as king 559 to 530 B.C. What Isaiah wrote would be like someone from the American Civil War era, predicting who the president would be by name and what he would do about 15 years from now. Only the Lord God could do such a thing, right? Cyrus, he saw himself in the Bible. King Cyrus saw himself in the Bible, and he understood only Israel's God could do this. And Jeremiah's prophecies also spoke of the Jewish people returning to Jerusalem. So listen to this from the book of Ezra. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, 
that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Oh, hallelujah. Is Bible prophecy important? Here are just two of many prophecies concerning the first coming of Messiah Jesus. First, the virgin birth of our Savior, Yeshua. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. She'll call his name Emmanuel, Isaiah chapter 7. And of course, we know the gospel accounts of Miriam, commonly translated Mary, the virgin who gave birth to our Savior, Jesus. He's our Savior and great King. Hallelujah. And, and let me explain to you the significance of the virgin birth. You know, so much hinges on the virgin birth of our Savior. Well, what do you mean? Well, the Bible teaches that from Adam, sin was transmitted, sin that kills us all, and everyone's dying of it, uh, except our Savior Jesus, who walked the earth as a man, a sinless man. How is that? Through the virgin birth. The Bible says in Romans 5.12 that uh, through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and death spread to all men. The fathers transmit this deadly disease called sin, all except the Father of our Savior Jesus, who is God the Father and has no sin, quite obviously, right? And so you have this sinless man walking the earth who lived a sinless life and was then qualified to take our sins upon himself. The wrath of God for our sins, our punishment, was laid upon him, which we'll see in greater detail, certainly, in just a moment. And, and then Isaiah speaks of the first and second coming of Messiah Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This child born and given speaks of the King of kings and the Lord of lords born into this sinful world. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. His name would be called and is called today Wonderful Counselor, El Gibor in Hebrew meaning Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Our Savior Jesus, He's a Father to us, though He's the Prince of Peace because He's also the only begotten Son of our Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. And, and never again will there be another government that will not operate completely under his rule and authority when? After his second coming. He'll sit on the throne of David and he'll reign over his kingdom from Jerusalem. And, and I, also, I often speak of the David covenant as I teach on this program. King Jesus is that son of David. He will arrange the world under his kingdom order, and there will be right judgment and righteousness, unlike this corrupt, evil, sinful world today. The Lord of hosts speaks of the Lord Jesus, the commander-in-chief of the armies in heaven, and his zeal for righteousness will be executed by and under King Yeshua himself today. Isaiah is making me want to watch, therefore, and be ready. How about you? I'll be back in just a moment. I want to take a moment to say thank you to those who prayerfully and financially partner with Watch Therefore Ministries. 
without you, we could not do this exciting and effective and timely kingdom work. The Lord certainly has raised you up for such a time as this. And again, thank you. In Matthew 24, our great Savior Jesus speaks of a faithful, wise, and blessed servant who's watching for the Master to come and doing what the Master commanded. My aim for this television ministry and all of our ministries is to make faithful servant disciples of Messiah Jesus who will hear him say to them, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And one of the ways we walk that out is through Romans 1.16, taking the gospel and discipleship to the Jew first and then to the nations. To the Jew first with our ministry, Blessing Israeli Believers, co-founded by our ministry partner, John McTurnan and myself, we're working through our Israeli believing partners who are getting out the gospel, making disciples of Messiah Yeshua, planting believing congregations, helping to save babies from abortion, and also helping Holocaust survivors in the name of Messiah Yeshua, and much more. And then to the nations through our ministry, Poured Out for the Nations, where we're serving in African countries. I personally have served in 10 African countries and in India through one of our believing partners and also in America and through this Watch Therefore telecast all over the world. 200 countries, 200 million homes. And one of the ways you can keep up with what's going on in this ministry is through our monthly Blessing Israeli Believers and Poured Out for the Nation's newsletters. I write about things that will help us to watch therefore and be ready, and also news and updates about what's going on here in Israel through our partners and in the nations. Oh, it's an exciting way also to keep up with what you can be praying for, for our prayer partners and what you're giving into for those who sow financially into this ministry. And I wanna talk about that for a moment. And as I talk about financial giving, first I wanna say, as always, if you haven't yet believed in our great savior, Jesus, please don't send any money into this ministry. It's simply our desire that you would be our guest watching the program today and that you would receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And for those who would like to lay up their treasures in heaven, who understand principles of giving and sowing into the kingdom of God, if this is a place the Lord's called you to do so, there's three primary platforms through which you can give. Our Watch Therefore television ministry, blessing Israeli believers and poured out for the nations. And you can do so through our website, watchtherefore.tv and also through the post, through snail mail at our PO box by check. And what a great way to lay your treasures up in heaven. Having said all these things, remember today more than ever, watch therefore and be ready. Our King and Savior Jesus is coming for us any moment. The rapture is the next big event on the Lord's prophetic calendar. It will be the greatest thing that could ever take place in the life of a disciple of Messiah Jesus. Despite this clear event in scripture, there exists much confusion and heated debate around the rapture. These questions and more are answered in my new book, The Gospel Truth About the Rapture. What is it? Is it in the Bible? Why is there so much confusion about this topic? Why do fewer church leaders teach about the rapture today? Why has it become increasingly unpopular? Since there are different views and positions, can we know the truth about the rapture? Why is the rapture important to the Lord's disciples? The events found in the gospel truth about the rapture are leaping off its pages. Like never before, these scriptural truths pertain directly to the disciples of the Lord in this generation. If you would like your life to become dramatically more dynamic and hopeful, read and implement the gospel truth about the rapture. And with a tax-deductible gift of any amount to say thank you, we will send a copy of my new book, The Gospel Truth About the Rapture. Be sure to write Rapture Book in the check memo section or online giving notes. And be sure to watch therefore and be ready. King Jesus is coming for us any moment. Welcome back to this episode of Watch Therefore in this teaching series, Profiles from Isaiah. And this powerful prophet writes what are known as the four servant songs that are within this powerfully prophetic book from heaven. And we're going to touch on just two of these servant songs 
today. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Excuse me again, hallelujah and hallelujah and hallelujah. This speaks directly of our Savior Jesus, who would come with his gospel to the Jews first and then to the nations, and he would do so about 700 years later after this was written. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and then to the Greek or the Gentiles or the nations. Yes? And, and we, of course, see this most clearly, this great gospel in Isaiah chapter 53, this powerful servant song. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The Lord's ways are not man's ways. Man can't understand or perceive how the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he wouldn't be born like in a palace kind of environment. Yes, and, and, and that he wouldn't look like the great mythical figure Adonis. No. No, Messiah Jesus was born in the lowest place, and, and he didn't look like someone any different. He looked like the common man. Why? Because he came to save the common man. He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Most of Israel and most from the nations of the world have rejected Jesus the Lord from the time he was on the earth even up till now. And his way in the earth at his first coming was a way of sorrows. The Catholics attempted to chart a path or a route where Jesus the Lord carried his cross through the old city of Jerusalem. It's called the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows. He was despised by so many when he came. He carried our griefs and sorrows. And we're, we're born into this world so lost that though we understand and experience and know a measure of grief and sorrow in this life, it's nothing to be compared to what awaits the grief and sorrow in the next life. Hell and the eternal torment of the lake of fire for all who have sinned and all have sinned and that he came to take our sorrowful sinful state upon himself the wrath of God for our sins was poured out on him and on his way to and on the cross there were so many mourning for Jesus and then there were others who were mocking him esteeming him as being cursed by God smitten by God Yes, listen to this. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. And then uh, in Matthew, likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he's the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Wow. Well, Isaiah 53 continues, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This speaks of our Savior's wounds and stripes from the scourging by the Roman soldiers and then the crucifixion, the most tormenting way to die that gives us the word excruciating. You've heard of excruciating pain. That word excruciating comes from 
the crucifixion. Isaiah continues, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah wrote this 700 years earlier, and with pinpoint accuracy and details, and much more. Messiah Jesus was constantly attacked and insulted. The Lord did not defend himself at his mock trial. He was held in a temporary dungeon and then crucified for our sins. He died between two thieves and was buried in a rich man's grave. He was the most and only righteous man who ever walked on this earth. And who does Isaiah say killed Messiah Jesus? I'll say this again. And who does Isaiah say killed Messiah Jesus? This may surprise you. It was our Father in heaven. Oh, oh. And yes, it's true that there's the perspective of our sins killed Messiah Jesus because he took our sins upon himself. But listen to what Isaiah says. Yet it pleased Jehovah. This is Jehovah the Father. There's Jehovah the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, or Jehovah. Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This is the resurrection and then later second coming of Messiah Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. The grave couldn't hold him down. Sin couldn't defeat him, and he rose from the grave. Oh, hallelujah. And hallelujah. Listen, if you're not excited about the resurrection of Messiah Jesus, you need to get right with God. You need to get right with God because it's the most exciting thing that's ever happened ever in humanity. This king, this savior died on the cross for our sins and he's alive. And he's alive. Yes, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul into death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Yes, it pleased our Heavenly Father to send his beloved, only begotten Son, because he loves people in the world so much that he would send him to die for our sins. And this great servant, righteous servant, Savior, did what the Father said by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he went to the cross, and he died this excruciating humiliating death publicly for us. Yet the Lord says he will divide the spoil with him and those who follow him. Yes, he's coming back. He's coming back to rule and to reign. Oh, hallelujah. And oh, hallelujah. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. He paid the price. He paid the price, and he's going to receive the reward for his suffering. Do you know what his his reward is? You. You and me. His reward is that which he purchased with his blood. Us. We who would admit to him, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against you, and I know that you love me, and you don't want me to go to this place called hell. And and, and, and I, I need your righteousness. You think, you think you might need a car or a house or more money or whatever, and you, and you may need some of those things, but nothing like you need righteousness. When you stand before God in judgment, there's one thing you're going to care about, having his righteousness that allows you into his heaven. And you get that by receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you can do that today. Yes. And if you've already done that, you need to get excited that you have it. You need to get excited that I have God's righteousness. Whatever's going on, around my, going on around my life today, the good, bad, and the ugly, I have the righteousness of, of God the Father in Jesus Christ, the righteous servant who died for my sins and rose again. Hallelujah and hallelujah and hallelujah. So how important is Bible prophecy? Think about this. The first coming of Messiah Jesus, 
the, the religious, those who were keepers of, gatekeepers of the book, where all of these things were written, a few hundred prophecies written about the first coming of Messiah Jesus, and they couldn't see him standing right in front of them, right? Well, what about today? As there's over 1,800 prophecies about his second coming, and the signs of them are leaping off the pages. And, and so many in the church are snorville, <clears throat> sleeping through it. Wake up! Wake up, sleeper! King Jesus is coming. The rapture is any moment. It is at hand. Any moment, he could come and take us up. Watch, therefore, and be ready. And if you need to get saved today, cry out, Jesus, Lord, save me. Please save me, Lord Jesus. And I know you died on the cross for my sins and rose again. I believe that. I'm going to turn away from my sins. That's to repent and believe in you today and follow you today. And if you'll do that, he'll send his Holy Spirit to live in you and give you a brand new heart and a brand new life. And you can then choose to follow him and, and to choose against sin and choose the ways of God. And he'll give you his mind, the mind of Christ. We do that today. Cry out to him today. And if you're doing that, there's information at the bottom of your screen. Contact us. Someone contacted us off our last program I watched. Contact us. I was watching the program as they were watching the program in different parts of the country. And they called and prayed to receive Jesus. Lord, call me. Do that. And get this brochure, How to Begin Your New Life in Christ. We'll send it to you. There's information on your screen. Okay? This is the time, folks. Bible prophecy is incredibly important. It's it's front and center important right now as the Lord is, is putting on the display and warning the world the red lights are flashing. King Jesus is coming and the wrath of God is about to fall. Yes, more than ever, it's time to watch therefore and be ready. King Jesus is coming for us any moment. Thank you for watching the program today. Watch Therefore is sponsored by the friends and partners of Watch Therefore Ministries. In future programs, we'll have many more Watch Therefore teachings from the Bible, worship, and exciting interviews with our believing partners in Israel and around the world. Please contact us at doveforisrael at gmail.com. That's D-O-V-F-O-R. I-S-R-A-E-L at gmail.com. And if you would like to subscribe to our newsletter, you can fill out a contact form on the website watchtherefore.tv. We also have audio programs available on our website watchtherefore.tv. We are on social media since it is a great tool to share the gospel and communicate with one another. You can also find us there at Watch Therefore TV. Until next time, we're watching for King Jesus to return. Watch therefore and be ready. We know he came. The lamb who was slain, he'll come again. Our conquering king on that day. His sword will go forth to take back and restore us.